hey guys how are you doing i hope you're doing fine anytime you're watching this video welcome back to this channel yes if you're new here my name is terry if you are a returning subscriber thank you so much for the love and if you have not watched my previous videos that is on networking tips all the other videos please check them out and my latest one being networking videos please check it out yeah so today I'm talking about a topic that is very personal to me. <sighs> yeah, very personal to me. It's about money. You know, mula. Yeah, I know guys out here, we, we don't talk about money. Okay, we talk about money lightly. We don't go into details. Yeah, so today I want us to talk about money. And I want it to relate to a book that I'm reading. That is The Psychology of Money. And also about my personal experience with money. Yeah, these are very sensitive topic to me because if you come to think about it, why don't people say what they earn? Like point blank, I earn 45,000, I earn 30,000, I earn 18,000 without feeling like intimidated, without feeling like you're doing better than anyone else. Why don't people just talk openly about money? Come to think of it. Out here, have, have you ever shared what you earn with your friends? Uh, have you ever because personally uh i don't i don't share with everyone what i earn uh even if you get a gig you don't want to say what you you're earning in the gig why because money has been treated like a okay after sex it has been treated like a tabooish tabooish thing to talk about so today i'm talking about my personal experience with money and also relating it to a book i'm currently reading that is the psychology of money the psychology of money so the psychology of money is a book that has 20 chapters so in this video i'm talking about the 10 chapters yes i've read up to chapter 10 then i'll do another video to talk about the other 10 chapters yeah so guys stay with me and if you have not subscribed guys if you have not subscribed please subscribe let's now talk about money according to the according to me and according to the psychology of money yeah that is a book by morgan Housel. Did I say that right? Morgan Housel. Yeah, the author started talking about finances around 208. Yeah, around 208. So you can see he has some years of experiences. Yeah, so the book, okay, I've personally related with the book. I've loved it. And guys, if you, if you would like to read the book, you can just get an e-copy or a hard copy yeah, and just enlighten yourself. See money in another perspective of someone else to see whether you're on the right track or what you know about money yeah so i think the the author starts the book very well so this will sound like a book review and also how i uh, i relate with money personally and what i've learned yeah so the book starts with a very interesting topic that is no one is crazy and i came to understand that no one is crazy when it comes to money matters, no one is crazy. You can see someone else doing some things with money and you're like, are you seriously doing that with money? Yeah, just, just he says that people do, people do crazy things with money, but no one is crazy. And he gives a very good example. This is about lottery. When he did a research, uh, okay, he investigated a lottery company. And when he investigated, he came to learn that the poor people, are the people who play lottery so much. Unajua cheza lotto, sijui tu mahi kwa hii number. Those are the people, the poor people who play those games. Why? Because they see that as the breakthrough. Okay, this person doesn't have a job. This person earn wages. So the only breakthrough they have in mind is how they can win lottery and just pull through in life. For you, maybe you have a job. For you, you have investment plans. But for them, that is the poor people and the Ill maybe the illiterate. They don't have any other way to pull out in life. So they are seeing lottery as a way they can pull out. And I came to agree with him. Like people out here, some people are so, we can say hopeless about ever getting rich or not even rich. Oh, the book discourages using the word rich. We can talk about wealthy. Some people don't have hopes or even a plan of how they can become wealthy and stay wealthy. So the only platform they can see themselves pulling out is by playing lottery. That is why 
can we just uh, an example just hit my mind can we talk about the people who bet why do you bet so much like because i've seen friends especially in campus people really bet when you just get the 10k you want to put the 10k at stake so that you can get 100k when you get the 100 you want to put the 100 at stake so that you can get 1 million why 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 don't you just get the 2k and move because everyone wants to to move like cinema pata 10k i can also get the 100k so that is the that is the back and forth of money so whatever anyone else is doing with money and he came to say that finances are more emotional than their facts because come to think of it we we are all raised in different backgrounds we are all raised in different environment some of us saw our parents in entrepreneurship as our Others saw our parents in employment. Yeah, so we relate money differently as per the experiences we have had with money. Talk, for example, my case. Me have grown up in a in a normal homestead that kwambia hakuna pesa, and you believe that. So I've come to to the, something I'm unlearning. I have come to see money. As a scarce commodity so when you get money you try to hold it with all I'm, I'm not spending this money i'm just holding the money because my my belief or what i've grown up in is that i believe that money is not everywhere so i cannot be able to get the money when i spend it but other people grew in an environment that they can see the money you just give you just borrow 500 500 shillings you're given you just to Nayenda heat trip, you're paid for. So in, in your belief or in your subconscious, you know that money is everywhere and money is readily available. So how you relate with money and how I relate with money is totally different. I hope guys, I'm giving you ju just something about the book so that you can try and read the book. So how you relate with money is more of emotions rather than what you have learned or whatever you will learn yeah you see that moment you're bored you're feeling like everything is not working out and you just want to spend money that is emotional spending yeah so that is the first chapter it talks about no one is crazy with what they are doing with money this is because we have all been in different environments in different socioeconomic status in different situations so how you relate with money is more of how your belief system is rather than anything that you learn so if you if you see the way you are relating with money is not right you're supposed to now start unlearning those things to learn the right things that is what i'm doing that is what i'm i'm having i'm now getting to the ab abundant mindset that money is everywhere money is following me if if money is not coming to me, where else is it going? <laughs> yeah, so money is everywhere. The, the second chapter is about luck and risk. Ah, this was so interesting that some people are just rich by luck. Can you can you just can you just get that in your mind? Some people just get rich by luck. Yeah, they didn't put a lot of hard work, they didn't do extraordinary things they didn't wake up at 3 a.m some people just got rich by luck and okay this is something you cannot air out there openly telling people that you just got rich by luck because he says that the the thin line when i say he says that i'm referring now to the author of the book that is the psychology of money that is morgan housel he says that the thin there is a very thin line between risk and luck no, not risk and luck. There is a very thin line between being bold and being reckless. Yeah. You don't know when you're being bold or when you're being reckless. You know, when you're told to take those opportunity head on, you don't, the, the line between are you being bold or are you being reckless is very thin. Yeah. So he says that some things you do in life, maybe you will just do some things and things align for you and you just become wealthy. And other things, you just do them by risk and you become wealthy. So there are some people out here. Do you know Do you know of those billionaires you hear? The Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and everything. Some of them just got rich by luck. 
yeah some people i know most of you people might not agree with this but i saw some sense in it that some people get rich by luck or just things aligned for you at that particular moment and at this point he writes a letter to his son let me uh, i'll just paraphrase this just to make it uh, because i can't remember every word he says that all wealth does not come from hard work and all poverty does not come from laziness so keep this in mind when you're judging people and also when you're judging yourself that is very nice this is a letter he writes to his son so even you out there when you're judging people where they are, whether they are wealthy or poor just know some things are some wealth is not out of hard work and some poverty is not out of laziness we have people out here wanajituma kujituma people are out here they are just making moves out here and we can't see the we can't see the the massive growth yeah so just know that some things are some riches or some wealth is a, is from luck and luck and risk they are very they it's it's not something you can define at this is luck and at this is luck and this is hard work yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to put this in good, good words, but guys, you should try and read the book. Yeah, I have my notes here. Yeah, we have talked about luck and risk. I think we can go to the other one. I I love this one. I love chapter three. Chapter three is about know when it's enough. Oh God, this has never hit me. I think I've applied this in all my other areas of life, not only in finances. Just know when it's enough. Because when you're looking for money, there is uh let me quote let me just read this sentence for you because so that you can get it. He says mm, okay, he says that um uh, let me read for you. The hardest financial skill is getting the goalpost to stop moving. These are points he has given under the chapter three that is just know when it's enough. He says that just know when to put a goalpost. On finances because most of us let's take an example you you are out of your you are out of university you get a job you're paid 20,000 you you stay in the company for some time then you get to learn that there are people who are paid 30,000 you start competing for that position you get to the 30,000 30, position then after some time you realize that the manager is paid 100,000 you start competing for the 100,000 after you get to the 100,000 as a manager, now you learn that company A pays a manager 100,000 and company B pays their manager 200,000. You start doing what? Running for the company B. So, learning to put a goalpost on money is very is very hard. Like, if I ask you, you, you as my viewer or whoever is watching this video, do you know when to put a goalpost to the money that you're having? Like, you can just get 200,000 and just say, I'm enough. It's enough. Like, this is enough for me. So, in money matters, there is never enough. So, learning to put your personal goalpost on finances is very important. This is why you say that, I know I've earned 30,000 and this is enough for me at this particular moment and I'm good. And he says that when you are learning to put a goalpost, you will come into terms that you can have less than others, but it's enough for you. Can you just get that? You can have enough for yourself, but less than others. You can see, like he talks of a basketball player who who is competing with another one because Club B is paying this and Club B is paying another amount. But learn to know when it's it's enough for you because we will be out here chasing money chasing money chasing money never knowing when it's enough so learn to put your goal posts on money matters when it's enough for you yeah i have another point i want to read for you guys yes it's social com social comparison is the problem here about money matters that is why you will never get enough because you're comparing with your neighbor you're comparing with your colleague who is driving at lexus and you're just driving a vit you're comparing with so many people so you will never know when it's enough for you so the first thing know when it's enough for you after knowing when it's enough for you shun away from social comparison because it will kill you because in money matters you you just want to be better than everyone else 
if this one buys a Lexus, I want to start driving the best car than a Lexus. Just know when it's enough for you and stop with social comparison, especially on money matters, because you will die. I've been there, I've compared myself. Like, I have age mates who have more furnished houses like me, who are driving, who are doing what. But if I start comparing, which I have done, I've compared myself, and comparison is a is a thief of joy. If you just sit here and start comparing yourself, you will wallow in your problems. You will start having problems you didn't even have. So shun away from social comparison. Put your own goal post about money matters. Know when it's enough for you. And after that, shun away from social comparison. This is, All this is under chapter 3 that is never enough. Never enough. People, We have people out here who are risking everything just to get money. And we have a story of two people in that book who are involved in fraud. Is it fraudulent or who are involved in fraud? We have two people there who are involved in fraud. And some people even lost things they didn't think they can lose because they already, the people he's talking about, they are already rich. And their names are Rajat and Madoff. Rajat and Madoff involved themselves in fraud, but they already had enough. But they risked more. You, you got to a point of you're risking more to get more money. Why? And maybe it's enough for you. But because you are comparing yourself with someone else, you keep risking. So shun away from social comparison and put your own goalpost. Yeah. And I have at that point here, under chapter three, uh, the best thing is to, uh, the best thing is to agree you might have enough, but less than those around you. You might have enough for you, but less but less with those around you. I think I've said about it. So it don't compare yourself. Just have enough for you. Yeah. And the author goes ahead and says that there are things you should never risk for money. There are things you should never risk for money. And I want to read for you those examples. Oh God, I'm in chapter three and the video is 15 minutes. Wow. Reputation is invaluable. Freedom and independence is invaluable. Family and friends are invaluable. Being loved by those who you want to love you is invaluable. Happiness is invaluable and risks that and risks that can break this are not worth the risk. If you're getting money to lose those things, they are not worth it. it it's not worth it. So avoid risks that can make you compromise those things. That is your family, your reputation, your friends and your happiness. Yeah, we might be out here saying that it's everything against the bug. No, it's not everything. Yeah, let's learn to draw the line and we will make it out there. So the other thing he talks about in chapter 4 is about compounding. Compounding. It's called compo confounding compounding. Confounding compounding. And how I got to learn this is about, is about giving yourself time. Time to become wealthy. We are all here in your 20s and you want to be a billionaire. And in this case, um, this is the case he gives a, a, a very interesting story about Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is a, one of the greatest, one of the richest people. No, one of the wealthiest people in the world. Yeah. Um, what we, what the, what people don't know about Warren Buffett is that he started investing when he was 10 years old. Imagine Warren Buffett starting in, started investing when he was 10 years old. And people come here talking about Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, I think right now he's in his late 90s or late 80s, somewhere there, 80s or 90s. But people don't talk about that he started when he was 10 years old. That is the time he started in his investment. But right now, people talk about him as a billionaire but they don't give us the background story. So he says, uh, uh, by 30, he, he was worth $1 million. Warren Buffett was one, worth $1 million when he was 30. Yeah. So Warren Buffett has been investing for three quarter of a century. That is 75 years. So people out here tells tells you about investing but most of us young people can we just lift hands for those who have involved themselves in forex ah if you've ever done forex 
I just hope you were not in it for quick money because I was in it for quick money. I just wanted to get there are things I've tried for quick money. That is <laughs> that is forex. I've also tried online writing for quick money, but you just end up frust frustrated. Like for forex, I lost money and I didn't get rich. I didn't get rich. <laughs> and here I am. Yeah. So if you're investing for something for quick money, just get out of it. Get out of it. Because unless you're doing fraud, unless you're doing fraud, but out here for you to become rich, it takes some time. It takes some time. That is the confounding compound. How, t how, uh, and for the compound, let's say that you invested 100k in a in a certain let's say money market funds uh money market fund yeah so you invested 100k in money market fund so after the one year you get the five percent now the five percent in the next year it gets another five percent then after the one year the five percent of the last time of last year the five percent of this year now next year gets the interest that is now the compounding interest yeah that is how people become rich so let let no one lie to you that you will become rich in one day you will not become rich in one day i think the greatest lessons we all need to pick about investing from this book is that investing needs time investing it's not a one day thing it's not a one month thing it's not a it's not a some weeks thing it's a, it's something that needs time and he says that the greatest lesson people should learn about investing is just shutting up and wait just shut up and wait if you've invested in that thing just shut up and wait because it might take some time yeah and you need to you need to learn about the skill of waiting yeah so in also on the compounding effect he he gives an example of an oak tree when you plant an oak tree one year might not show much difference. Five years might show a slight difference, but 50 years might show now the significant difference. So if you're investing, if you want to be wealthy, just learn the skill of waiting. Then on the next chapter, he talks about getting wealthy and staying wealthy. You know, we all out here, we all out here want to get wealthy but how many of us can be able to maintain the wealth because maintain, he says maintaining wealth needs a lot of humility and knowing that your your past wealth might be attributed to luck and what you did to get your last wealth might not necessarily translate to you getting rich right now let's say you got a gig kitambo and you got the money but what makes you think that if you get a you what makes you think even right now you can get the gig so it needs a lot of humility it needs a lot of skill which we all need to learn okay here he has not specifically mentioned of how to maintain wealth but he says that you need the skills you need the skill to maintain your wealth because we have so many people who have gotten rich but have not been able to maintain the wealth yeah not rich, Terry not rich, it's wealth, yeah, who have not been able to maintain wealth. Yeah, so that is in chapter 6, that is getting wealthy and, no, chapter 5, sorry, not 6, getting wealthy and staying wealthy. Yeah, so on the next chapter, he talks about tails and wins. Tails is when you lose, wins is when you win. He's, he talks about that you can win, you can lose not win you can lose half of the time and still make a fortune and in this example he gives a uh, an example of the disney studio he says that actually the first uh, this is where i learned uh, i'm not a i'm not an animation fanatic but i know disney yeah he talks about disney he says that the disney studio the first disney studio went bankrupt but no one talks about that no one talks that this guy actually had a studio that went bankrupt. No one talks about all the productions he had done before he did Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The book says that only the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, that is the only thing that made that company boom. Yeah, so all the other things, all the other things he had lost, all the, mo all the animations he had produced and they were not hitting, no one talks about that. So you can lose half of the time and still make one book make one big move and 
Ula, you 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 pull it through yeah so losing okay oh, for me i've lost in money issues like i've i've tried business and it hasn't worked but you can lose half of the time i now sound like a motivational speaker but you need to hear this you can lose half of the time and still get a fortune when you win so he says the trick is how much do you lose when you what how much do you lose when you blues and how much do you make when you win so what you make when you win should be more than what you lose when you lose something yeah you let's say you open a business it doesn't pick how much do you lose and then you you open an uh you open another thing and it picks how much do you make so you need to balance on the tails and the wins how much you lose when you lose and how much you make when you win yeah so this I think the Disney studio is a very interesting story because he says that the 83 minutes of the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, that is everything in terms of business for Disney. That is what made Disney be on the map. That is what made Disney be recognized. It doesn't matter how many times he had produced, but that one time, the, the 83 minutes he produced the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, that is what made the difference. That, that, oh, that is what made the difference. So you can lose half of the time and still pull it through. So any failure, let it not hold you back. Let it not make you not to try. Just try it one more time because we have tails and wins and you can lose half of the time and still pull it through. Yeah. So the next thing he talks about freedom. And this hit me hard because I'm now one year in corporate world. one year in corporate world and i have come to learn the value of time so when you're striving for the bug the greatest dividend the bug should get you is control over your time so if you are out here chasing the bug please remember the greatest dividend money should earn you is control over your time because we are we okay j Generally speaking or authentically speaking, we sell our time for money. Yeah. So when you're making any investment, when you're making any financial goal, when you're making any financial plan, remember that time is the greatest dividend money should earn you. That is that you can just wake up one day and decide to rest. You can just wake up for six months and say, I'm just resting. I'm connecting with my family. I'm chasing my spirituality or anything because you have control over your time yeah so that is on freedom that is on freedom that is on chapter nine yeah and he's, he talks about a book that is 30 lessons for living there is a book by carl Pil huh? what is this name carl pilmer yeah carl pilmer he says that the 30 lessons of living that is the book uh, maybe i'll read and i'll bring you guys the review but he says that even in the, that book, it mentions that controlling your time is the greatest asset that you should have. Yeah. And this is, he talks about, uh, we all chase money to buy materialistic things. Let's talk of cars. He talks of, he has ever been a valet. A valet is someone who drives a chauffeur. Yeah, a chauffeur. So he has ever been a valet. When he was, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, a valet or whatever. He used to drive the best cars. But when when someone saw the car, he didn't think of the man driving the car. He only thought of the car and how he, the person would feel if they were driving the same car. And I also came to see, that's how I also view best cars, best houses. When I, I see a house, I don't think of the person who lives in that house. I think of how I would feel if I was living in that house. So for materialistic things, we chase, we chase them because of how they will make us feel. You, you see that feeling having your own home will give you you see that feeling of having 100k in your bank will make you feel that is the feeling you're chasing literally you're not chasing the bag you're chasing that feeling yeah he's yeah and i might read uh, let me read for you this this paraphrase no this is not paraphrase this quoted yeah you might think you want an expensive car a fancy watch and a huge house but i'm telling you you don't you don't but i'm telling you you don't what you want is respect and admiration from other people and you think having expensive stuff will bring it it is all it in 
almost never does especially from the people you want the respect and admiration from so if you think you want that watch if you think you want that car it's not that thing specifically you want you want the admiration of the people when they see you in that stuff yeah and more more often than not it doesn't it doesn't bring you that admiration we we think of the stuff and we think the, of the stuff when we have it ourselves so when i see a good car i don't think of the person who has the car i think of myself when i'm having the car yeah so if you're buying those stuff so that we can see you and think about you we are not thinking about you we are thinking of ourselves with that stuff yeah so if you're chasing the bag if you're chasing material things just be very careful i'll be here at 40. this youtube channel will still be here and i'll tell you that i have all those things but my lens are still straight. Oh, <laughs> anyway, joking. Yeah, no, not joking on the 40. I'll have all those things. Yeah, so let me tell you. He says in the book that humility, kindness, and empathy will bring you more respect than a horsepower will ever. So even if you're chasing the bug, even if you're chasing anything, just remember humility, kindness, and empathy will bring you all those things. Yeah, and in the last chapter that is not the last chapter the last chapter of this video because we're doing chapter one to chapter ten he talks about save your money save your money yeah he says that you don't you don't need a goal to save your money you don't need a goal and that made me feel very good because i'm a saver without a goal but i'm working on it yeah save your money and save save just save he says that high income people might not end up rich but high savers will probably end up rich yeah and i can read you the statement yeah uh he says that building wealth has nothing to do with your income and investment return and has lots to do with your saving rate so when you're saving please try to save try to save with a high rate yeah wealth is just the leftovers of what you remain uh, wealth is just leftovers of what remains when you save yeah so just bring your appetite down bring your appetite down on spending and mostly we don't spend for ourselves we spend for others we want to go to that fancy place so people that so people can see we want to do to buy stuff so people so that people can see we want to do this so that people can see please tame down your spending habits let's save with a high rate let's save responsibly and I think that is it for the 10 chapters. I think I've given you a, a spark so that you can read that book. It's a very interesting book. You might not agree with everything the book says, but it has a lot. Yeah. And he said on savings, he says that the best way to raise your savings is not to raise your income. It is to raise your humility. And when you raise your humility, when you raise your humility, your spending tempts down. Yeah. So if you if you if you're not saving, I don't I don't know how you need us to convince you to save, but you need to save. Yeah. And and the last point, saving in the bank can earn you zero interest. Saving in the bank can earn you zero interest rate, but can actually generate an extraordinary return if they if it gives you a chance to take a job with a lower salary but more purpose. Yeah, so saving, it's not all about the the valuable things that I have 100k in the bank. Saving has also the invaluable part that I feel more, I feel less worry when I have 100k in the account. Why? Because I know even if things went south and I don't have that job anymore, I can pay for my rent for like three months and I'll, I'll have settled. Yeah, so saving has more to do with invaluable things that is the less worry the security to explore your career to change your career path because you have more money and i hope this video has given you a spark to try read that book that is the psychology of money and if you have not subscribed please subscribe it's free of charge it's free of charge and it makes me feel like i'm offering you something that is is valuable yeah and thank you so much guys for the support remember to give the video a thumbs up to share with your friends and always it's a pleasure you watching my videos and coming up to the end and
Until next time, guys, out.